Welcome to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we are continuing our series on intuition and people that we call intuitives. Now, in previous podcasts, we define intuitives as people who use advanced pattern recognition as their primary learning style. And we contrasted that with the other learning style, uh, which is called sensory learning style. And the difference between the two is that sensors value reliable, verifiable information, and intuitives prefer depth of insight and speed of information, and so are willing to make speculative leaps. And if this is your primary learning style, then it completely changes the flavor of your personality type. So we've got a series of podcasts dedicated to people who use that intuitive learning style. And we recommend that you go back and listen to our previous podcasts on what is intuition and the two different styles of intuition if you'd like a frame of reference. Yeah, because it's going to give you a really good breakdown of how uh, how there's like nuance between the styles of intuition because not just intuitive people, but they also have two different flavors. And so those are really going to be key for understanding more of what we're going to build upon in this episode and future episodes. Yeah. And what we talked about in previous episodes was a percentage breakdown of how many people use intuition as their learning style versus people who use a sensory learning style. Yeah, and really it's about a 25-75 split between the two. So our world, a majority of people, about 75% of the population, at least in the Western Hemisphere, North American Hemisphere, uh, North American uh, continent, because uh, that's where some of this research has been done, is about 75% of the people will use a sensory learning style, meaning they're learning through their senses, sensation, they're looking for verifiable information, and about 25% of that intuitive style, intuitive learning style. And what this does, like we've talked about in previous podcasts, is it sets up a dynamic where the majority rules, right? So you have a world that's pretty much created for a sensory learning style and it's catering to that style of person because that's the majority of people in our world. It's very similar, we used this analogy before, very similar to a left-handed person living in a right-handed person's world. You know, our our mouse on our computer's on the right side, so a left-hander, they're out of luck. They gotta figure out how to use a mouse on a desktop computer on the right side or use scissors that are designed for right-handers. And they kinda have to adapt and, and basically make it work in a world that's not designed for them. Right. So for people who are intuitive, they experience something very similar. They navigate a world that is designed for a different style of learning than what their preference is. And so they end up being sort of ambidextrous, just like a left-hander is forced to become at least moderately ambidextrous in a right-hand world. And and we mentioned this last time in one of the previous podcasts. I'm a right-hander, and I don't even think about left-handers. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I don't even... I, like it's not something that occupies my like mental real estate at all. Like when I pick up a pair of scissors, I don't think, "Oh, I wonder how left-handed people use this pair of scissors." Like I just pick them up and use them. And it's really similar for sensors and intuitives. Like sensors don't really think about intuitives. They don't really consider that there's a percentage of the population that think radically different, that have a totally different frame of reference for how they navigate and understand the world, what's interesting to them, what their individual needs are. They don't really think about it. And so intuitives end up, well, two things happen. Intuitives, number one, end up not getting a lot of needs met because nobody really is thinking about getting their needs met. And the intuitive doesn't really know how to do that for themselves since there's not a lot of say, intuitive mentorship programs that are real obvious. And so intuitives tend to not get some pretty profound needs met. And the second thing that happens is that that intuitives can start to believe that they're broken. Uh, They can start to believe that they are the only one like them, that they're major big fat weirdos, and that there is something just profoundly wrong with them. And, And if a sensory environment has reinforced this, then the intuitive not only feels like odd man out, but then they've been told that they're odd man out. And that just compounds the problem. They just believe, oh, well, I must just be profoundly broken in some way. Yeah. You you actually told the story to a friend of ours today. Uh, you know, there's that 12-year-old kid who his mom is like, you know, I, 
me and my husband were normal. I was a cheerleader. My husband was, you know, on the football team. We went to college. We got jobs. And now I've got this 12-year-old who's into weird stuff, like, you know, just things I don't understand. And he wants to have conversations that are really abstract and all this. And I, I think he's brought, I need to go get him some Ritalin or get him fixed or have him go to a shrink. <laughs> right. I think he has ADD. He's got ADD. Something's <laughs> wrong with this kid because he right. just doesn't think the way that me and my, uh, we right. don't, me and my husband didn't think like this when we were kids. Right. What is wrong with my son? Right. I was popular. Why is my kid a dad? <laughs> yeah. Why, why, why is, you know, why is this kid a geek or whatever? So it's this kind of thing like, uh, intuitives sometimes don't have people that understand. And and the, I think the biggest thing about it is that intuitives ourselves, if we don't understand this about ourselves, we are going through life with this ability of pattern recognition, whether it's like we talked about before, in, introverted or extroverted, but we're still going through life going, how do I see stuff that other people don't see? I'm seeing things and I'm making connections that seem so so real to me and when I talk to other people, they're like, what? That's not what's going on. That's And then sure enough, I might be right down the road or I right. might have seen something and made a pattern connection. I was like, see, I know. I knew I was right about this and like, or not right necessarily, but I knew I saw something here. I knew I saw a pattern and I don't even know how I saw this. So what, what is it about me? Mm-hmm. Why do I, I don't fit in. I feel so weird and so odd and so out of the loop. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make a note that not all intuitives are geeks or duds. <laughs> and I, I might be overvaluing well, my own they're ex- listening. They're listening to us. Of exactly. course not. Exactly. Of course not. We're not geeks or duds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I might be overvaluing my own experience a little bit because I was a raging geek in high school. So... I always use that as my frame of reference. I know plenty of intuitives that were massively popular in school. That is not the norm, though. I think intuitives have a tendency to know their difference, and that is something they contend with regardless of their quote-unquote status of popularity in high school. Yeah. And the reason why we're referencing that is that that's oftentimes a reference point for the person themselves. Like, why is it that I had trouble making friends growing up? Why is it that nobody really could understand me? Yeah. So I don't want to indicate that that's like the sign of being intuitive is that you know you're playing Dungeons and Dragons library during lunch or anything, but it's it uh, it can be a like sort of a common marker um, that intuitive share is that yeah they were misunderstood they were into stuff that other people weren't and so it, you know it was confusing. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is that there is a sense that people get because intuitives do see behind the curtain because they can pattern recognize they don't get the the sort of the privilege of blissful ignorance like some people are pretty you know considered weird maybe but they have no idea that they're weird they just never have that self-consciousness yeah and while, you know, perspectives users, the introverted style of intuition can sometimes be a little detached from how they're, like, basically how they're showing up, like how other people are seeing them, that can be something that they grapple with a little bit. Most intuitives start to pick up pretty early on that they're, like, other people are not seeing them as the same. Yeah. So it's not like they can be different and then not get that. They're different and frequently they know that. They're very aware of it. And so they do get this feeling that there's something not just different, but wrong, right? Because it's, you know, we we think in terms of contrast. And as we're growing up, we have all these value judgments given to us. Like little kids are forever deeming things in black and white and forever deeming things as either good or bad. So different ends up being either deemed good or bad. And Mm -hmm. frequently for intuitives, the difference ends up being called bad. I think the reason why we reference geek sometimes is because actually uh, the the in, so there's obviously as an intuitive you have you have other skills that come along with your intuition your pattern recognition I think that the intuitives that tend to skew toward the like the intellectual end of things I think people seem to they just they chalk it up to well that they're just a genius they're smart they're super intelligent more intelligent than anybody else and so that's why they're so weird or different and yeah sometimes they might be they might have a tendency toward geekiness or not. It depends. But I think because intelligence is valued, even among, you know, people that use a sensory learning, so intelligence, like raw analytical type intelligence is valued by a lot of people. It's kind of like, well, they're just, they're just so smart. That's why they're weird. And they kind of almost give them a pass for being mm-hmm. smart and weird. Right. I think it's, a, it's an even more challenge for an intuitive, someone who uses an intuitive learning style 
when their their talent doesn't lie in analytical intelligence. They might not mm-hmm. be dumb, but that's not they're not getting super high, you know, scores on their SATs and super high IQ test scores. Mm-hmm. Theirs is more in the arts or performance mm-hmm. or making artistic connections or uh, other types of connections. I think those people sometimes, those types of intuitives sometimes don't get the, well, they're just smart. And that's why they're so weird. Right. Pa- past that is because, given to the smart people. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, because they are smart, but they're not smart in sort of that conventional way. Correct. They're not yeah. smart on the IQ test way. Maybe they are as well, but they're not. that's not what they're choosing to have as their showcase of mm-hmm. bringing to the world. Right. Is, so, is that making sense of yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, and so there's not a convenient category to put them in. I, I think of the show Big Bang Theory. Mm-hmm. The main character is an intuitive character who uses intuitive learning style to make a lot of connections. And he's very geeky, obviously. And people, it's, it's, all of America gives him a pass for being so weird because he's so intelligent. It's like they come together Mm -hmm. as a package. Right. But if that same show was around somebody in a different discipline that wasn't around intelligence or analytical Mm -hmm. intelligence, I have a feeling that people would be, I don't think he'd get as much of a pass from everybody. Less amused. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you aren't easy to categorize, if there's not like a easy archetype to put you in, it's really easy to get dismissed yeah. uh, as just a weirdo. I, I know of a kid who's an intuitive. I may have mentioned this in a previous podcast. I actually don't remember. But I know of a kid who is an intuitive whose parents took him to a psychologist and said, this kid is broken. Yeah. And the psychologist was like, no, no, he's not. <laughs> he's not broken. He's just very different. <laughs> he's just different. And they're like, oh, no, he's broken. And so, and, and in part, it was because this kid couldn't be, can, you know, categorized. And so it was very difficult for his sensor parents to get him. Like, like I'm not sure exactly where he fits. I don't have a frame of reference for this. So I don't think they were intending to send a message to him that there was something profoundly wrong. I think that they were just legitimately trying to understand their son. I think it was just something that they, they were having to struggle with. And they wanted the psychologist to understand exactly how serious the issue was so they used a word that they probably didn't even mean this kid is broken yeah what they were really trying to say is there is a brokenness in our relationship and can you help repair and fix that but they weren't sure how to articulate that so they they put it on the kid because they know they're not broken so if they're if the relationship is broken then it must be on the other person's side and that's particularly sad because now you've got this kid that's you know been given a message totally erroneously and accidentally and all intended in a positive way like everybody had positive intent and yet still the message was sent that he's not okay yeah and i think this brings us full circle to what we're talking about today because people that use a sensory learning style are looking for that concrete tangible in their minds, they have categories for everything. Everything fits into a nice, neat package. And if you as an intuitive don't fit into that nice, neat package, you have one of two options. You continue to be kind of out there and and no one knows where to place you, or you take control of the situation and you place yourself into some type of a nice, neat package so people can relate to you. But when you do that, by definition, you're now giving up a part of your true authentic identity because you're fitting into a definition someone else has instead of your own definition. And I think you lose a huge piece of yourself in the midst of that. And that's really what we're talking about today. Right. We have a word for that. That, By the way, that was a beautiful explanation of what's going on there. And the word we use to encapsulate that is blending. Yeah. Those are intuitives that start blending. They don't want to be birds of paradise. They don't want to stand out. They don't want people to notice this part of them because they get no support for it. And sometimes they get punished for it. And so they start pretending like they're like everybody else. They're able to, they're able to speak both languages, just like we talk about left-handers being at least to some extent ambidextrous. Intuitives can sort of speak both languages. They can speak the sensory language and the intuitive language. So they just start hiding the intuitive language and they pick up the sensory language and they just run with it. Like you said, though, they end up denying and neglecting a very, well, an integral piece of who they are. Absolutely. A part that can't simply go away because they don't want anybody else to find out about 
<laughs> like blending by definition means suppressing yeah. who you are. And everybody, I, I would say the universal, there's a universal need that people have to be understood. Like all of us need to feel understood as individuals. And if, a, if an intuitive starts to blend, then they have disqualified themselves from being understood because they won't bring themselves, they, they, they won't. They're not being authentic. Yeah, they won't show enough of themselves to be able to be understood. And I've seen a lot of intuitives say that, well, you know, even if I show up as an intuitive, I still have a lot of one-sided relationships yeah. where I know the other person way more than they know me. Very common for, for intuitives to say that. I'm just surrounded by one-sided relationships. And it's in part because this intuitive aspect of them is, you know, this is so so much a piece of who they are. And they feel so vulnerable when they expose it that that by definition means that they're going to have one-sided relationships. And as they ease this intuitive part out little by little, right, in the relationship and they show more and more and more of it, it's really easy for them to get spooked. So if there's any negative feedback because it's already such a raw open wound, those sort of run back behind whatever defense mechanisms or strategies they're using, in particular blending, and people blend in a variety of ways. They run back behind that defense strategy, and now they're stuck in one-sided relationships. Yeah, and I think the other the other piece of this too is whatever we do in life, we get more of, right? If we go down, like you kind of go down, you're on trajectories. You have momentum behind you in things, and so if you're someone who uses an intuitive learning style, and you've decided for whatever reason to blend, like we're talking about, put yourself into some category so people can relate to you, and you've been doing this for a while now, you begin to build some identity around this. And part of that, part of that piece of you, it's almost, it's almost, I've, in fact, we, we live in this town where we know a few intuitives that are like this. They've been living in the shadows behind their, this category they've given themselves of whatever. They're truly intuitive, but they don't show that side of the world very much or hardly ever. And now they're almost stuck there. They almost feel like they feel trapped in this place. And I think this is like our program intuitive awakening really speaks to this. It's like, um, it's it's the it's the the ability to say I'm going to start breaking back into my intuition, my intuitive self, and become more my authentic self again. And it's a tough road because you've been building these frameworks and and ways of doing things and categories and how you're relating to the world that to extract yourself out of, people are going to think you've lost your mind or you have now... What, you, Who is this been, person? Yeah, you've always been this way and now all of a sudden <laughs> you're this way and what is going on for you? Yeah. Like, how are you... Like, so So you got this message maybe young and you decide to build some walls and frameworks and some categories around yourself to help protect yourself in this sensory world you're living in and now that you are uh, listening maybe to these podcasts and you're starting to get an, an inkling of what this actually is for you and what's going on inside your heart and your mind and what your authentic self is... It's going to be tough sometimes to extract yourself and bring yourself back into that intuitive self because you've been spending so much time blending like we're talking about. Yeah, well, and no, again, nobody wants the one-sided relationships to be exposed either because even if deep down inside you know that these are one-sided relationships, like, you know, part of blending is not admitting to yourself that you are allowing a very important part of who you are to go you know, to go very neglected. And so if I go, well, crap, I've been basically building one-sided relationships my entire life, and my house of cards of my tribe or my relationships or the people who are important to me, that will all come crumbling down if I step into my intuitive power. That might not be worth it. It, yeah. might, be, it might be worth it to continue to blend, you know, and play it safe than to, you know, just basically go, yeah, I've been kind of living a lie. <laughs> <laughs> and it might not feel that bad in, you know, like, well, no, I can I can show this part of who I am to my friends and family, and they'll be totally fine with it. However, the people who are really invested in blending, they know that's a lie. They know that they yeah. can't do that because they would have already done that if they could. Yeah. If they really believed they had permission to do that, they would have already done it. Because that's what we really want to do, <laughs> is we want to, again, be understood for who we are. And so... One, I, I, want, I want to touch on two things that blending does to an intuitive. I think that blending is extremely, uh, it's very damaging. I think it's very damaging to an intuitive. And in, in 
primarily because it does two really painful things or creates two painful scenarios. The first scenario is that any intuitive that blends is by definition not getting one of their primary needs met and that is intuitive conversation. Running into other intuitives and having that really high level intuitive cross-pollinating conversation where you're idea generating and the other person is idea generating and you're speculating and you're talking about what could be and you're talking about you know you're talking about things that are both outside the box and you're talking about the box itself right like yeah. those conversations that is like food for an intuitive that is nourishment if you don't get enough of that your soul will starve People who are intuitive that blend may not get very much of that, if at all, you know, any of that at all, unless they're willing to open themselves up to other people as intuitive. And the sad thing is that if you're blending, how many other intuitives are also blending? So if you ran into each other, you might never know that this person is the one person who can be getting your profound fundamental nourishment need met, but you both are still talking about the weather because that's what you've taught yourself to do in order to play it safe. Absolutely. So that's the first really damaging thing that blending does, is it doesn't allow you to get one of your very unique, but not any less fundamental needs met. You have to get that need met as an intuitive, otherwise you will collapse it on yourself. I know tons of intuitives that don't get that need met and and they believe that they are just chronically chemically depressed. Yeah. So they're on medication. And it's so sad because I'm like seriously, it now I'm not saying that chemical depression doesn't exist. It very well could be. You might need to be on medication. I'm not trying to indicate or diminish that as a real situation. However, I have known some intuitives that if they just allowed themselves to express themselves authentically, they would allow themselves to get into a flow state. They would allow themselves to get their their own minds to fuel them and give their them energy by being in flow in the world. And they might not need to be on antidepressants. Yeah. And I, I think this is a difference between you and I. I think you stumbled onto this concept of intuition at a younger age than I did. You kind of had an idea, an inkling of intuition. And so you were able to identify other intuitives kind of, and you also grew up on the West Coast of the United States, which is more of, I believe, more intuitive friendly space than the East Coast of the United States where I grew up. And I didn't have language for some of the things I was going through. And so I think, you know, for me, I think I ran into a lot of intuitives. I'm discovering people from my past who I've kind of been friends with since I was a teenager who had I known about intuition and had I known I was an intuitive and they were an intuitive, I probably would have purposely pursued friendships with them more because I realized, oh, if I pursue this friendship, both of our guards can come down and we can have really high level intuitive conversation, but we can't do that. But I didn't know that could exist. You know, I just, they were blending. I was blending. I assumed they didn't, it was going to be a one-sided relationship just like all my other one-sided relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't pursue people like that. Yeah. And now I'm finding like, our friend, our mutual friend, uh, Melanie, who I've known since a teenager, I'm finding out, oh, I, I think she's an intuitive and mm -hmm. I could have been having intuitive conversation with her since I was like 15 or 16. And I didn't even know that. I didn't know to pursue that relationship of a friendship with her because I just assumed, I, I didn't know what was going on there basically. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is really key if you can get this. And like you said, it's it's so powerful because now you have language, you have a, a, a way to understand that, oh, this person might be blending also. And if we could just kind of get past that, bam, magic could happen. I could yeah. have somebody to converse with and that very needed conversation. Yeah, and the solution is is to be the example. The other intuitives are probably blending too. Yeah. Because they're experiencing the same thing that you're experiencing. So one of you has to come out of hiding, right, in order to signal the other person. So why not be have it be you? Right. And again, that can feel scary because you may have actually built a life. I mean, I know people who blend because they feel that their marriages would be threatened if they really, truly exposed who they were to their mate. Yeah. That's scary. I mean, the cost of that is huge. You might have kids. You might have like all sorts of stuff together. I mean, it's a it's a big unraveling ball that might happen from that. Right. And and yet 
if you're in hiding, they're probably in hiding too, <laughs> right? Like, what if you accidentally married an intuitive? <laughs> now, uh, it's highly likely that two intuitives that marry each other would have figured that out pretty early on. Yeah. And they would have been like, this is the only person that's ever understood me in my entire life. And come to find out it's because they're, you know, you're both intuitives and you revealed that to each other. And I don't, I know plenty of intuitive sensor relationships that have lasted a very long time. I don't think that's the death knell for a relationship. And I don't even think an intuitive allowing the sensor person, you know, mate to understand their unique, you know, their their unique needs and who they are deep down inside. I mean, the sensor might have a little trouble grasping it to some extent, but I've never seen that kill a relationship. Yeah. I've never seen that kill a marriage. I know that that's one of the fears, but I've never actually seen it. I mean, my parents, my mom's an intuitive, my dad's a censor, and they've been married for like 50 years. Same so, here. My parents are the same way. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that it, de- it definitely can, there's lots of success stories of those kinds of relationships, but that doesn't mean that the fear isn't real, right? Like that's the fear. So one of you has to come out of hiding. Like, if you run into other intuitives, somebody's got to, you know, be the example. So be the example. Have courage. Like, be the person who comes out and goes, yeah, I'm the weirdo. Oh, you're a weirdo too? Awesome. Let's go talk about weirdo stuff. And the the level of increased joy and happiness in intuitive's life when they just stop pretending, when they just stop blending, yeah, there might be a little bit of fallout. There might be a little bit of, like, why did you never express this before or like I didn't know this about you it's so minimal <laughs> like it's so minimal and the pain of going through that situation is nothing compared to the daily pain you experience blending right we call the blending experience death by a thousand cuts yeah right like it's just it's a thousand times a day you get these little messages that you're not okay and you gotta hide gotta hide you gotta hide it's really unsustainable, which is why people in that situation oftentimes get depressed because it's just an unsustainable mo- you know, model. You're still burning hot like an intuitive is, but you just don't have any direction or outlet. So there's really, there's really nothing but to just run out of gas. So I highly recommend, I highly recommend being the example. I highly recommend being the intuitive that comes out of hiding. The second thing I wanted to mention that happens when intuitives blend is that there is a There is a fundamental need that I have seen in almost every intuitive I've ever run into. Not every single one, right? And and sometimes I wonder if this need is not expressed in some intuitives because they're still blending. But the need that I've seen that all intuitives have is that they want to make an impact. They work for impact. Now, it could be big game impact. It could be I want to change the world. Or it could be small game impact that I just want to make a difference in my community. It doesn't matter. Every intuitive I've ever met on some level wants to make an impact. I th- yeah, I think the reason this probably comes up is because if you are seeing, uh, as an intuitive, you're seeing patterns, you are, I think by definition, you're seeing a little bit more of a zoomed out, more abstract perspective. And so you have you're seeing maybe problems and connections of problems and challenges in the world that other people may not be seeing. And so you're like, wow, I see these connections. Is there anybody doing anything about this connection I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. I don't even think anybody's connecting these two things, let alone doing anything about it. Right. And so I think it stirs up in your your heart and your mind, maybe I could be the one to do something impactful in this connection I'm seeing up here in this abstract space. Right, exactly. So intuitives just, yeah, they're, I think they're not, I think you hit the nail on the head. They're natural problem solvers. And they want to solve problems and they want to make an impact. They want the they want the world to give them feedback for how well they solve the problem. And that, you know, that test iterates, that problem solving, that getting feedback, that doing better next time, that's basically the formula for impact in the world. And so intuitives just naturally want to make an impact. The ones who are like, I just want to go to my cubicle job and just go home and, you know, watch the voice. Like, those are intuitives that have usually some wounding. Like, they've been hurt, and they just don't want to get hurt again, which is understandable, right? The world can be harsh, right? That said, there's still something inside them. (laughs) There's still something inside them that really wishes they could make an impact. And I believe that the reason why 25% of the population is intuitive and 75% of the population is sensory is that I think that 25% is meant to make an impact, 
I believe that that is their job. Their job is to be mavens, to be people who are early adopters, to be people who have foresight into the direction things are going and to be able to steer humanity in, you know, in thoughtful, uh, better predicted ways than just, okay, well, I guess we're just going to see what happens next, (laughs) right? Like, I believe that intuitives have a, a true gift for leadership. Even if it's that, if, if even if it's not like people leadership, even if it's not like management style leadership, I think that they're at the very minimum very inspiring when they let themselves be. If you're blending though, you are not making an impact. And just like that need to have cross pollinating idea generating conversation is a unique need to you that if you don't get it, you will close in on yourself. Yeah. I believe that having an impact on your environment is the same for an intuitive. And I'm not saying that, you know, sensors can't desire or enjoy that kind of conversation. And I'm not saying that sensors can't want to make an impact. Plenty of them do. And they do a very good job. I think, though, with intuitives, though, it's grafted to their identity. It's something that's just a piece of who they are. And they couldn't shut it off if they wanted to. So what blending... The disservice that blending does, the second major damaging disservice it does, is it renders or at least disqualifies the intuitive from having the impact that they just, I don't even know if you could call it genetically, but just to the core of who they are, that impact they want to have. Yeah, and and a a sensory learning style person, a a sensor who is going to make an impact, because like Antonia said, plenty of them do they're going to probably make an impact based on something that's verifiable. They've already kind of vetted the information. It's not going to be very speculative type impacts, typically. Now, they can happen, but it's going to be usually something like that is a little bit more tried and true type impact, and they're going to work toward that tried and true impact. And I think the reason why intuitives, I think the, the word I would use is skittish. They're almost skittish to take the lead and try to make an impact sometimes is because the nature of it is speculative. Some right. of these connections they're making, there's no certainty that it's going to work out. And and as an intuitive, you know that most people don't like that kind of movement where you're going right. to go down a road where, <laughs> look, I kind of have a hunch this is going to lead this way. If our company implements, you know, let's say it's not a world changing impact, just in your company, you want to impact, you want to do something small for the employees in your company, you bring a great idea to the CEO. And he's like, well, how's this going to impact the bottom line? You're like, well, I just kind of have a feeling it's going to. I just kind of get this gut that this is like the direction we need to go. And he's like, well, can you show me on paper? It's like, you can't really show him until you experience it together as a company. And it's like, how do you prove it? You can't yeah. prove it ahead of time. And you're skittish to take that initial leadership or that step because people are like, well, if you can't prove this in numbers or you can't verify this or give tangible data sets, we don't really want to implement it. And you kind of know this already as an intuitive. So I think that's why intuitives are like very skittish on some of this stuff. Yeah. It doesn't give us an excuse not to take the lead if we can, if we can. but it, right. it is a reason why I think a lot of people are like, I don't know, man, this right. feels like, whoa, I, I don't know if I want to do this. And, and it is valid that if you have a speculative concept or idea that others would want to vet it. Yeah. So that so that push pull relationship is actually important. However, that doesn't mean that you're not right. So finding a way to convince others to at least have a go, <laughs> you know, like that's the job of an intuitive is to find creative ways to get people to let you be creative, uh, to find ways to allow people to, you know, to let, give you that opportunity to test iterate. And, and if you if you have been blending. You've been practicing how to speak in sensor language. So actually, you're poised in a really great place because if you begin to awaken your intuition, go through that intuitive awakening, you are able to speak bilingual. You are able to cross-pollinate and speak to the other side because you've been doing it for a while. So you actually are poised. If someone embraced their intuition early on, they may have never developed a skill set. You're in a really great space if you've been blending because now when you do awaken your intuition you have language to communicate to people who may not understand intuitive ideas or tu- intuitive conversation, intuitive abstract thoughts, but you can sometimes bring those back down the ladder of abstraction to help people understand those and make them more concrete. And you can actually have even a bigger impact because of that blending you've been through. That's a great point. You know, intuitives that have given themselves permission to be weirdos their whole lives, that doesn't mean that they can't 
speak a language that is understandable. But we usually see that those are usually the people who make an impact despite themselves. <laughs> yeah. Or not not despite themselves, because of who they are, but despite the fact that they might not be able to really communicate it with other people very well. However, people who have been used to blending, they're, the disadvantage is that they have more trouble giving themselves permission. And yet when they finally do, give themselves permission, you're right. They've been building the skill the whole time to be able to communicate in that bilingual way. Uh, yeah, in that bilingual way. So I think that that's a fantastic It's really point. exciting, actually, to yeah. be intuitive in this space because you have so much potential now yeah. and so much skill built that it's yeah. really exciting to see that come alive. Absolutely. So you were talking about the Intuitive Awakening program, and I just want to mention that we're going to be launching a program specifically designed for intuitives. Now, we, we already launched this program before, but we're doing kind of a 2.0 version of a program we call Intuitive Awakening, which is designed to make sure that intuitives really step into the best version of themselves, really reclaim the power that they have just sort of genetically given to them. You know, I mean, it's an accident whether or not you're born intuitive or not. And yet... That whole adage with great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) If, I mean, there's only 25% of the population that's intuitive. And if all of them go blending, then the world stagnates, right? Like we don't, we don't get the advantage of having those intuitives in the ecosystem, in the perfect social ecosystem that's set up. I mean, there's only 25%. So we kind of need them all. So if you're an intuitive that resonates with this concept of blending, if you're an intuitive that doesn't feel like you've really reclaimed this part of you, we want to invite you to check out the program Intuitive Awakening as it comes up later. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about it in future emails. So if you're not, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't signed up to our email list, we really recommend you go to personalityhacker.com and uh, as a bonus, go take the free version of the assessment if you'd like. Find out if you have intuition as one of your learning styles or one of the styles of intuition as your learning style. Uh, if you come up as, either as exploration or perspectives, those are the intuitive learning styles. And that automatically signs you up to our email list, which I recommend being a part of because we're going to start leaking some really cool content information, some free line content if you're not interested in the program, but just kind of want to get an idea of what this is all about. Yeah. And become a part of our email list so that you can get really good, high quality, cool stuff on becoming a better version of yourself, specifically as an intuitive. Yeah. And we obviously, you know, we we do this as our, our business, our livelihood. We'd love for you to take the program, but we also have a mission of awakening people's intuition if they're intuitives. And so we have a lot of free stuff that's coming out, a lot of videos, a lot of like this podcast, obviously things like this, we can communicate with you. Please ask questions, come on the Facebook page and communicate. We are building a community of people of like minds there. Um, So there's an exciting community emerging of intuitive and it's a fragile space to be in, especially when you're going through this initial intuitive awakening experience. You're, you're sometimes in a fragile state because you're, you're really vulnerable to people who maybe you've you've been blending in front of for a mm-hmm. long time, and now you're going to be all of a sudden changing some big aspects of who you are. Yeah. And so you need a community to support you. And so we want to be there for you regardless if you come through a program of ours or not. This is important to us. Yeah. And you're important to us, and we want you to be a part of that community regardless. This is the impact we want to make yeah. in the world. Like The way that we want to change the world is we want to light intuitives up. We want to be the pilot light that helps intuitives really get inspired to become the best versions of themselves. Because we believe it's really the way to kind of solve all the world's problems. (laughs) Like, if we had every intuitive lit up and really focused on making an impact, a positive impact on the world, whether big or small game, can you imagine how much true progress we could make we could make some serious progress so it's it's part of it's part of our mission is to make sure that intuitives feel supported that they feel good about who they are that they give themselves full permission to be intuitive and that they're lit up to do to make the impact and you know be the change they want to see and then go make the change too yeah we want to make sure that we are we are here for intuitives. Chances are, if you're listening to this, you're probably an intuitive learning style because we talk a lot about intuitive stuff. We have these kind of conversations. But to know for sure, head over to the website. You can find out if you're perspectives or exploration. 
You can take the test for free just to get your initial results. And, uh, and either one of those is an intuitive learning style. That means you are an intuitive. And that's a good thing to know as you continue to listen to all this stuff about intuition because you're going to want to know that about yourself. And, uh, and obviously, you know, we'd love for you to join the program. But also, come over to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash personality hacker. Make yourself known there. Introduce yourself. Say, hey, guys. Uh, feel free to make comments and ask questions. So we'd love to dialogue with you there. Right. And you can make a comment on our website, personalityhacker.com. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you would like us to talk about in the future. If you've got any subject you'd really like us to focus on. Or you can find us at on Twitter at Twitter forward slash personality hack. Yeah, they wouldn't let us get the whole hacker in right. there, so H-A-C-K. <laughs> so come be a part of the conversation because that's that's what kind of what we're here for. Absolutely. So in the meantime, I'm Antonia Dodge. And I'm Joel Mark Witt. We will talk to you on the next episode. <laughs>